The mewling cry that you hear from your baby son fills me with fear and dread. He's been sick for two days. He's weak and thin and racked with pain. And try as he might, he's so dehydrated that no tears can run down those hollow cheeks. As you lean over him, numb with grief and shock, a wave of desperation engulfs you. It's okay, you tell yourself. You're smart, you can think, you need to think. You need to think what to do. You don't have food, you don't have water, your medicine supply has run out. You can't afford to take him to a clinic. You don't have a job, nor could you get one in a, in a country with a very high unemployment. The father is long gone to the city in search of a job. You haven't heard from him in 10 months. You don't know if he's got a new family, a new job, or even if he's still alive. You've asked your family for help, and they've given you what they can. They've loaned you a buck or two, they've given you some food, but now they don't have anything to give. You've asked your friends, but they're also on the breadline. The country is in a grip of a severe economic recession. The government is stretched beyond capacity. Charities have run out of handouts. Even the churches can't help. There's no cash in the system, no crops in the bleak hunger zone, and no support for you. Everything is dry and scorched and parched, and everyone is pinched with hunger and wrung out with worry. And you've got four more kids to look after, and no one left to turn to for help. You pick up your baby, floppy with exhaustion, and grip him tightly as panic rises in your chest. You have no chance, no choice, no options. What are you going to do? This story has happened so many times here in Africa that it runs through the blood of African women. When you can't get a job and you don't have money and every day is a battle for survival, what can you do? You're out of options. So every day, people resort to acts of desperation. The media likes to regale us with stories of um, the desperate crimes that people, people resort to. A baby abandonment, murder, suicide. And this does happen sometimes. But actually, a much more common coping strategy, a daily act of desperation, if you will, is to have transactional sex. That is, to have sex in exchange for what you need. Now, I'm not talking about prostitution. This is not a profession. And I'm not urging us to condone this, because I don't think we can turn our back on it. This is a coping mechanism, not a profession. And um, it is promoted widely all over the world. It doesn't just happen in Africa. It happens all over the world. And it's promoted in the literature, arts, movie industry, and music. This is Nicki Minaj. You might not recognize her, because she's not normally photographed from this angle. She's normally photographed from this one. She's been dominating the charts in Europe and the US since 2010. And uh, she's a very well-known rap star. And her, one of her most recent songs is called Swag. And it basically boasted about how much swag she gets from her boyfriend in exchange for sex. And there are many more songs she does, but I don't want to share the lyrics with you. They're not for today. Um, but this theme is not new. I mean, you remember Money, 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 that catchy song by ABBA? Or Diamonds are a girl's best friend, or the current songs of Zimbabwean hip hop star Junior Brown. What about Mrs. Bennett from Pride and Prejudice? She was the one who was very obsessed with getting her daughters married off to men of good breeding and fortune. 
Or what about Cinderella? Or a thousand other folk tales? And other children's stories with the same basic plot? Over and over and over again, we are told that it is, in order to be successful, girls need to find a man who's wealthy and can support them. And boys are told that in order to attract a beautiful woman and in order to be successful in life, they need wealth. So, as it were, once you peer under the sheets, transactional sex is everywhere. So, if transactional sex happens everywhere, and if it's like a daily occurrence, maybe a little bit taboo, then what's the problem? Well, the problem is here in Southern Africa, the, the, one, of the, one of the most common HIV transmission routes is through unprotected sex between men and women. And in most instances of transactional sex, there's no condom involved. Girls are especially at risk of getting HIV between the ages of 15 and 24. So this is a pretty serious issue. I first began to understand how widespread transactional sex is when I was a naive aid worker in the 1990s here in Zimbabwe. I uh, went with a team, a team of colleagues and we went to do a research study at a school in a peri-urban area where we wanted to talk to children about what they knew about HIV and sexual health. You couldn't imagine, or maybe you can't, my surprise when it came out very casually that some girls were going with guys in order to get a snack. The reality was this. The school was in an economically deprived area um, and most families were living hand to mouth. After school, boys were encouraged to go and get jobs, to go and um, do petty trading at the local village, and girls were to be protected. Conventional wisdom meant girls were not really allowed outside of, allowed outside of school or their house because they're at risk of predation, rape, violence, or other forms of danger. So they were locked up tight, as it were, went home, and they would engage in domestic chores. Now, do you remember how exhausting school was? I mean, I know we have some teachers here. They might, they might see this in there amongst their, their, their pupils. You had to cope with algebra tests and spelling tests and avoiding being noticed by the school bully. It was kind of really exhausting. Plus, your body was changing so quickly and so scarily that it, the whole thing was really, frankly, overwhelming, a bit embarrassing, and made you supremely hungry. Well now, can you imagine by lunchtime, if you haven't had anything to eat and you've been up since 5 o'clock in the morning doing your, your chores and your, and your homework and your schoolwork, you're getting pretty hungry and you've got a whole afternoon and evening stretching out ahead of you. That's a long time without food. So if someone you know comes and possibly says, hey, I'll buy you some food, all you have to do is this one small thing and you don't even really understand the significance of it, well, you can see how it could happen. So by keeping girls safely at home after school and by encouraging boys to become junior entrepreneurs, in fact, parents and society were placing their daughters at the very risk they were trying to prevent. So how can we protect our girls? Firstly, like it or not, we need to talk about gender. The whole gender debate boils down to this. Basically, even before you were born, once it is known if you're a boy or a girl, you're expected to move through society in a certain way, have certain responsibilities, and behave in a certain manner. Um, personally, I can't wait for the day we stop squabbling about who's in control and who's on top, men versus women, etc. To me, gender equity is not about that at all. It's, in fact, about building an equal partnership. It's kind of like the ideal marriage. You consult with each other, you, you, you share ideas, you share decision-making, and you share responsibility. And um, one member will take the lead when it seems appropriate, and um, the other can step in when it's their turn. That way we work together, we can lighten each other's loads, and have consultation and equity. And it's about really, really it's about caring for each other. And if we can achieve this, I tell you what, girls will be empowered to make safer choices. Next, keeping girls in school is critical. 
girl with a fifth grade education is more likely to marry later, get a job, and is, um, uh, ha has up half the risk of getting HIV in her life. Thirdly, we need to support women and girls to find a safe way to learn and earn, earn a living. It really, really concerns me as a development worker that many policymakers seem to assume that educating girls is the magic bullet. If we educate girls, they'll get jobs and live happily ever after. Excuse me, have you looked outside and seen the job situation? I don't think there are enough jobs in the world for everybody, men or women. Um, uh, gone are those heady days of full employment. Our world is crowded and it's competitive. But we can rise to the challenge, especially if we can help to build entrepreneurial skills and knowledge. And with the pace of technological change that's coming, um, we can't even imagine what opportunities that will be available in five years' time. It wasn't that long ago that you actually, <laughs> cell phones were so large, you actually had to buy a car to carry them around. There was no way they were going to fit in your pocket. Who remembers that? I do. Um, and, it, and, and even at that time, only very few buffins and a few select military commanders had ever heard of anything like the internet. It's just not available. So what's it going to be like in five years' time when we put on our Google glasses that we've printed for free in our 5D printer and we look at the world? It's going to be a whole new place. And how do we prepare our kids for this? if we can't even imagine what this is going to be. Well, I think there's some simple, simple answers to that. First of all, let them get really, really comfortable with technology. Maybe even more comfortable than you are. It's okay. It's their world. Let them explore. Let them do it. Let them take your phone and develop an app that tells you how great they are. Or reminds you every five minutes to buy them a really big present. That's cool. That's growing. And secondly, give them that entrepreneurial know-how that Zimbabweans excel at. You know what I'm saying, don't you? Make a plan. No Zessa? Make a plan. No water? Make a plan. No jobs? Make a plan. We are great at this. It's something we can teach our kids. We, we, can, we can imbue them with the knowledge and the skills and the resourcefulness to actually always make a plan. <laughs> and if if we can teach them to get to, to um, learn how to train other people to get excited about an idea ha they have, then they can always garner the support to make this dream that they have into reality. If we can show them how to bootstrap a business by using free resources, so you can start a startup with practically no investment, then they are set for life. No matter what happens, they'll be able to get up and start again and start over and succeed. And by the way, if you are a middle class and you are thinking that your daughter or your niece is safely protected in some private school or university and you don't really need to listen to what I'm saying, think again. Right now, there are girls at elite private schools and universities who are at this very minute skipping class to go and find themselves a boyfriend to take care of them to find a husband before they lose their looks and get too old. It doesn't matter that their parents have given them everything. It doesn't matter that they have all the support. It's, it's, they don't see that. It doesn't matter they have the best schooling and the best resources and the best parents in the universe. They don't see that. It's not that they're ungrateful. It's just that they've been influenced by these gender and society norms and um, they can't see any other way forward for them. They're so afraid of losing what they have, that fabulous life you've given them, that they're blind. They're simply blind. They're in a blind panic, and they don't see any other way except to find a good husband to take care of them. This is what we've been telling them. It's kind of right. So they could be putting their lives at risk. So make sure that you keep an eye on your children, because... A moment's inattention can have them slipping away from you down a dangerous path. So if you do have a daughter or a niece or a sister or a friend, just make sure you show her that she has options. Make sure you don't just tell her, show her that she has options and make sure she can see them. 
Show her that she's clever and bright and strong, and she can make her way and make a plan and get by and thrive. Find a good role model or a good mentor to inspire her and to teach them and to champion her and to show her that it's possible. You know, a woman has made her own success and is doing really well. Now, you might be thinking at this point, well, there's lots of choices on that, but who's the best one? Well, may I offer a little divine inspiration? You might be thinking, divine inspiration? Oh, but possibly this is not the divine you were thinking of. This is Divine Simbi Indlakula. If you haven't heard of her yet, you soon will. Here she is winning the prestigious Regatum Africa Award for Entrepreneurship. She's been dubbed one of Africa's most successful women by Forbes magazine, and she's won numerous awards. She's the owner of a well-known sec well security company here in town, which she started up in the light, late 1990s. Today, it has an annual turnover of over 10 million, 4,000 employees, and a display cabinet bursting with industry awards. Um, but the, the thing that what marks her out as an exceptional role model to me is that Divine helps other women achieve financial security and independence. Her company is the largest female employer in the country outside the government, and she works tirelessly to help train women entrepreneurs and build discussions, platforms for learning discussions and debates. So given that today's TED theme is Praxis, turning ideas into practice, I thought I'd give you three simple ideas to help grow women enterprise and accelerate the end of AIDS. And here they are. Firstly, tell your sons and daughters about successful, strong women entrepreneurs. May I recommend a bit of divine inspiration? Secondly, take your daughters to work and teach them about entrepreneurial skills, how to build a business, how to run a business, what to do when things get tricky. And thirdly, buy products and services from women entrepreneurs. When you have a choice, always use a women entrepreneur because I can tell you that they have much less options to, get to grow their businesses. Um, multinational companies can always find another, another customer. Now, before I go, I just want to let you into a little secret. The secret is this. Me being here today is actually an act of desperation. I am desperate that we change the situation we have. I am desperate that we get women and babies and children choices in life. I am desperate that men have choices in life too that do not mean they have to constantly provide. And although I'm desperate and although I see the situation that we're in as quite difficult, I'm also kind of pulled forward by this vision of hope, a hope for a new society where we can work together we can realize the importance of women entrepreneurs and we can imbue them with the school skills, knowledge, and resources that they have. So that's what I'm working for. I know that Divine and Lakula is going to do everything she can to make this happen. I'm going to do everything I can to make this happen. And I'm proud to say that millions of women are joining me and millions of men, too, are realizing the importance of economic empowerment for women. So now it's your turn. You have the future of your daughters and your granddaughters in your very hands. What are you going to do to make sure that they have the best options in life? Thank you.